So we're just about to start. Yeah, on set? Perfect. So um, it's nine o'clock, uh, professors, distinguished guests, and viewers all over the world. I wish you a warm welcome to the launch webinar of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation 2023. We are here in the beautiful Harpa Conference Hall in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, my name is Åsa Sandberg. I work with sustainable food and food waste, and I have the great honor to be moderating this webinar today. This is the biggest update to the Nordic nutrition recommendation so far, and it's based on significantly improved methodology that is aligned to global standards. In addition to health, this sixth edition of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation, it integrates environmental aspect into the recommendations for the first time. This means that the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation provides recommendations not only about which food is good for your health, but also about what is good for the planet. We will listen to many great speakers today explaining more about the recommendations. But first, I would like to give a warm welcome to Karen Elleman, Secretary General, Nordic Council of Ministers, to say a few words. Please welcome up on stage, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to all of you here and online. Today, we are actually taking a bold step towards a more healthy and sustainable food consumption. I'm really happy to be standing here in Reykjavik and introducing this webinar that will actually provide this deep dive in the research behind the new sixth edition of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations. For the first time in the recommendations 40 plus years history, the new edition will not only tell us what is good for our health, but also what is good for the health of our planet. The previous edition was downloaded more than 300,000 times, and this one will likely be well surpassed with the NNR 2023. For people working, I mean, no, I have to say that this is a key step for the Nordic vision for 2030 and our global commitments. And for people working within the food sector, there will be a before and after the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023. This is a big day. And the results that we are going to hear about today will be used and will be discussed for the years to come. Because this is not just another report. The recommendations will provide a direct effect for the Nordic citizens. So I think we all know that there has been a lot of debates around this new edition, and there has been strong interest and a record number of comments in the public consultations of the background papers. All comments from the consultations have been made publicly available, and in the autumn, a full report summarizing both the comments and how they have been considered in the final work will be published. This is a strong testament for the open and transparent democratic process in which these new recommendations have been developed. I would argue that this is how we know that something important is about to happen, something that will affect us all in our everyday lives. Food engages like nothing else. Food is a central part of our everyday life. It plays a pivotal role for our health and our well-being, and it is a crucial part of our culture. Through food, we can express our creativity, we celebrate our holidays. Even through this uh, highly scientific, um, uh, I mean, even though this is a very highly scientific publication, it is one of those Nordic projects that has a direct impact and benefit for our citizens 
as it guides what food is recommended for you and what is served in our schools, in our hospitals and in other public kitchens. The recommendations are the flagship of Nordic Corporation, where national health and food agencies, universities and other institutions are joining forces to produce something that one country could not do by itself. I know many of the several hundreds of researchers and experts who have contributed to this report. You are either here in the room or you're following the discussion online. I know for a fact, because I spoke with some of you, that you have put years of work to this publication. And you are the ones that have ensured that we stand here today with a globally leading piece of work. So I really want to give you my warmest thanks for your efforts. Thank you so much. This is, I would call it, labor of love. It is a personal highlight for me to stand before you today and to introduce the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023. The change towards a healthy and sustainable Nordic region starts with our food and the shift for more healthy and sustainable eating starts here today. So thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Karen, for those words. And uh, <clears throat> we will kick off this webinar now. Um, and again, listen to some great members uh, from the Nordic Nutrition Committee uh, 2023. But first, uh, I want to listen to the mastermind behind the recommendation. Uh, which is the head of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation 2023 Committee and professor from University of Oslo and Oslo University Hospital in Norway, Rune Blomhoff. Come up, please. Uh, so, Rune, uh, if you can just stand here with me for one second, because uh, I think we're just, uh, we have a little bit of um, sound uh, trickiness on there. So, I'm, I think I'm going to just talk to you for a little bit okay. while we solve this. Is that okay? Oh, please talk. Perfect. What uh, did you. What? I, I'm not that good at small talk, so you can do the small talk. <laughs> that's, that's I'm just going to uh, talk about myself. I can do it. I could talk about food waste while we're standing here then. That's great. I think we're going to get a thumbnail. Thumbs up, Ben. But uh, like maybe you can just tell me a little bit about like the process of this recommendation. If we just put aside this, mm -hmm. this like, like you have worked with this now for what? F is it four years? Well, actually, it started two years before then because then we worked on a, on a pre-project uh, that formulate the project description in close collaboration with the Nordic Council of Minister. So that took about one one and a half year when you formulated the project, the, 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 the limitation, the scope, uh, and then they engaged in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the real process. And that took uh, four and a half years. Initially, it was planned to take four years, but then we asked for extension because um, it was a huge work, extensive work. And uh, also the other main reason was that uh, the publication for the, for the IPCC the, the, the climate pa panel was also delayed for half a year. So, so that, um, that, that then we extended to four and a half year. So it has been really a, a huge uh, effort in, in not only for me, but for the, for the committee. I'm really impressed by the committee's work, but also from the hundreds of scientists that have contributed to this work. It's really a, a huge, I mean, and also the universities that allow scientists to work on their pay time at the university on this report. It's fantastic. So it's really a huge dugnad. I'm not sure what you call it in English, <laughs> but it's really a huge dugnad from the Nordic and Baltic countries. It, it really is. Can you, like you might say this already in your presentation, but when, <clears throat> how, uh, you, I mean, there's professors and scientists all over the world that have worked with this, right? Mm. So how, how, how does one do that? Like, do you apply to, like, did you handpick them all? Um, of course, we had um, a huge open call. And then we had uh, hundreds of, of interested people. We went th very thoroughly through their 
competence, their CVs, and then we selected those that had uh, the best competence, according to our view, and also we tried to find the, the, the a proper, proper um, representation from each region. Um, but of course, we, we also needed to go out and hunt and try to get the best, and also some, some from abroad, from other countries, to really contribute so that we... And, but but the, the, the NNR committee is really, they did, they have the sole responsibility for selecting the experts. And they are, they are the responsibility of the final wording of the report. So we are, uh, we are, we are the, the presenting the report today. So uh, can I ask you like on a personal note, like you have obviously worked with this for, as we just heard, uh, quite a few years. Like what, I mean, you probably had several, but if you can mention just maybe one or two, like what, what, what was your biggest maybe surprise of the recommendations or finding for, for you on, on, on a personal level? Um. I think the biggest surprise was the big help we, we got from COVID. Oh, interesting. I think COVID... <laughs> That's interesting, and please explain. I think COVID really improved the quality of this report. Because otherwise, before COVID, we would travel. We will travel a lot. But of course, that would restrict the meetings. We, <laughs> we can't travel every week. But now we have had meetings in the last... Uh, every second week or every week, several hours every week, we have sit together and worked on the, on the report. And that would not have been possible before mm. COVID. So Zoom team is really the biggest surprise that we did not expect before starting in, in this project, but that has really improved the quality of the, of, of the report. Uh, but uh, I guess that it was not what you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, w it was definitely an interesting, interesting uh, <laughs> reflection. But maybe from a like you know a nutrition point yeah. of view, health, environmental point of view. But I do think it was an interesting answer. Um, from the, I, I was not surprised at all, because uh, I'll try to explain because. This, Science is very seldom jumping in big steps and in other direction. It is certainly building blocks, stone by stone. So um, scientific consensus is weakened or, or strengthened. So it builds up gradually. So there are a few big surprises to me in this report. It builds up stronger and stronger. And we never, build, we never make conclusion from one paper or two papers, or 10 papers, or 30 papers. We make conclusions that when there are some development in epidemiology, when there is some development in clinical studies, in mechanistic studies, and then we look at the overall picture, and then it gradually devel develops, become clearer, and then we focus more and more, and, and the hypothesis becomes clearer and clearer. So, no big surprise, but steady working steady developing of, 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 of science. And so now when, when, when this is done, what are you gonna, are you gonna take like a few years vacation now or <laughs> what, what's, gonna, what's gonna happen now? Um, I will go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> that's an amazing... That, that's a short question. <laughs> so that's I really look forward to summer holiday, of course, and uh, fishing and gardening. Growing vegetables, potatoes. <laughs> oh, I look forward to it. <laughs> you know what? I think if anybody deserves <laughs> going fishing and growing potatoes, I think it is you. <laughs> and now I've got the thumbs up for us to continue. So I'm going to leave the stage to you and I'm going to get you to move over here a little bit so that you don't get the projecting um, thing there. Mm. Perfect. Please take I it away and you need the clicker and it's just here. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, it's a really great pleasure to, uh, to present to you today the NNR report 2023. It has been a long road, a lot of work, and now we are here. Um, as you know, um, NNR collaboration they, they, they has a strong history. 
a strong and long history. The first report started in 1980. Then there have been five reports. It's 11 years since the last report. And now we are presenting the, sec the sixth report, NNR 2023. Is it important, really important for you to know that NNR is not science advice to the community, to people. It is science advice to authorities. So now, when we deliver our report, the authorities' work will start, and then they will formulate national food-based dietary guidelines and national uh, uh, nutrient recommendations. So this report was initiated by a pre-project in 2016. And then we developed a project description in collaboration with close collaboration with the Nordic Council of Ministers. It was accepted. It was funded by the Nordic Council of Ministers. And uh, now, after four and a half years, we are able to deliver our report. Um, so it's important there are some development from the last uh, NNR in 12. First of all, um, we have invited also the Baltic uh, countries to participate in the NNR project. They have for many years used the NNR as a background for their national policies, but now this time we have also invited them into the committee and into, to participate in the work. And of course, um, we, um, uh, we, the NNR has also been extended when it comes to scope. In previous editions, we have only focused on nutrient recommendations. Uh, this time, uh, and Nordic Council of Ministers took the bold step of also inviting us to develop a framework for food-based dietary guidelines. And in addition, an even bolder step to in involve environmental impact of the food consumption into the food-based dietary guidelines. So, uh, while many hundred scientists have contributed to this work, many of you are listening today, um, and we are really grateful to all of you that have contributed to the report in so fantastic way. It is really the NLR committee that have the main responsibility of this report, that has organized the project and run the whole project. And it's also the NNR committee, as you see here, with representatives from, from all the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries, that have the sole responsibility of the final wording in the NNR report. So I would also like to uh, just mention that we, I think we have a very strong organization of the NNR. I think we did some clever work in organizing the work. In addition to all these, multidisciplinary scientists that have been invited and contributed directly to background papers. We have also had a, a systematic review center that, are, that have digged deep into specific topics. So they have really contributed and really grateful to the systematic review center. And in addition, we have an international scientific advisory board which has given us huge and imp important uh, advice on how to organize, how to develop how to, uh, the methodology and to harmonize the methodology from some of the best organization authorities in the world that, that, that are developing similar guidelines and recommendations for other countries or, or other regions. So I think the organization is, is, is really an important uh, Important, has an important role in the formulation and in the end product, the NNR report. Then I think it's really important also for you to, to understand what is in, involved, what is included, and what is not included in the NNR. NNR includes, as I told you, uh, updated uh, nutrient recommendations. And NNR also includes a framework for national, guide, national dietary guidelines based on health and environment. Previously, all considerations in the NAR has been based on health. This time, we also include considerations on, on environment. So, 
So the so what's new in the NNR report? I would say that everything is new in the NNR report 2023. What, have, what has been published today is the, what we call the summary report, or the main report. The summary report is about 400 pages. So please forgive that it's so large, <laughs> but it is really the summary report of this big work. The main report is a digital version. It's not a book, it's a digital version. Uh, you can go into the digital version, and you can download the PDF if you'd like, or the whole summary report. And later this fall, also, there will be availability to, a possibility to buy a book of this summary report. That will be available during the fall. Then we have what we call an extended, the extended uh, NNR 2023 report. That will, that will be published early fall. That, include, that will include about 80 background papers. All of those background papers will also be published in uh, Food and Nutrition Research. So they will be publicly available um, for everybody and also available through this, through this Nordic Council of Ministers website. And then you can go down there and also download a PDF of those uh, background papers. The responsibility of the background papers are, of course, the authors. The authors are responsible, and the NNR committee has served as a more or less an, as an editorial function, as in the journal. So, so that is... Um, and then we will also publish later this fall a report on, uh, on the public consultations. We have had public consultation for more than 60 papers the last one and a half year. And they have really contributed a lot of, uh, of, of input and, and interesting input and important input to our report. And all of this will be published also this fall with our short comments, how we have dealt with each individual uh, comment. So please look for these, uh, this extended report and um, the uh, report from the public consultation when, uh, later this fall. I thought I'd just to mention one important thing, and that is that um, our target group has changed from NNR 12. Uh, in NNR 12, the target group was a healthy population, or the apparently healthy population. But a large, so large part of the population are, have a disease. So this time, in accordance with uh, the guidelines in the US, National Academy of Sciences, the EFSA, the Europe, we define the target group as the general population. So now everybody is included, if not explicitly excluded. So now people with disease, with cardiovascular diseases, with cancer, with diabetes, with obesity, Everybody is included, if not excluded. Um, so some of the groups are excluded in our report. And, um, and, that, and maybe you, have, you may have a disease which directly affects the nutrient requirement. That is some, one reason that could, could be for exclusion. Or you may have a food allergy or intolerances. That may, that's so that you will be excluded from that particular food. It might also be decided by health personnel, but in case by case, um, uh, whether the, 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 new, the NNR should apply to you or not. So you will listen much more uh, to the other speakers today on on more dig deeper into the NNR. But I will just give you a short uh, presentation on what you will uh, learn during this webinar. In the next presentation, you will learn more about the methodology. I think we really have developed a cutting edge methodology. We have used strongly for 
International Global Harmonization of Methodology. We have learned a lot from discussion with authorities in other parts of the world to improve, learn from others, and I think they also have learned a little bit from us. So there's a huge exchange of ideas and to improve methodology. And as you also will see, we have a um, very th thorough um, system for checks and balances. So to really try to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to omit bias and to improve the quality as objectively as possible. You will learn that we have a new fundament for scientific assessment of, of health effects, which I think is really a great idea, and I think it will also improve sharing of resources between authorities. That is what we call qualified systematic reviews. You will have a presentation of that later today. And you will also learn about how the framework we have developed for integrate environmental is issues into the dietary guidelines. And I think also the very open, transparent, democratic process that we have, um, have selected is, is really also uh, one of the major, has a major impact on the final report. It has certainly improved the quality. I hope that we have been very open to all this input that has been uh, sent to us and treated them well. We have considered them carefully, and I think they have really improved the quality of the report. Of course, today you will just have a few ideas, very short ideas about the report. You should really go into the report and look into more details. But this is just a teaser. Please go into the report to have much more details. Uh, due to the new methodology, we have recalculated all nutrients. Um, we, have, um, uh, we have updated the methodology for, 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 uh, for, nut for, for nutrient recommendations. And in addition to an extensive literature, updated literature review, uh, we have new weight curves for, for the Nordic and Baltic countries. We have a lot of new issues when it comes to the methodology. So that is completely updated. And that resulted in, in, that, in, the, in the fact that eight nutrients received dietary reference values for the first time. And here you see those eight, eight nutrients. Also, a number of, of nutrients have received slightly changed values for the dietary reference values. And uh, for nine of them, the changes have been more than 20%. So to be transparent, so that we understand why we have changed those values, we have also in the report explained in detail why these values have been changed. So this is in the report. We comment this example, for instance, on vitamin E or vitamin six, B6, why the values have been changed. Then you should also go into the, what we call the bond pager, the summary of the nutrients, to have more details. And then you can even go into more details. We're going into the background papers. We really discuss this in huge detail. So, uh, and then, as I told you, we have also then in implemented um, recommendation of food groups, meal and dietary patterns. And we considered 17 food groups. And for 16 of these, um, we uh, food groups and meal and dietary patterns. And for one group, for food group, we did not uh, develop a dietary guideline because we thought it was not appropriate at this time. But for all the others, we did. We did not develop a dietary guideline for ultra-processed foods. And that is because the definition and categorization of ultra-processed food is very broad and not too specific. The definition includes both healthy and unhealthy foods, certainly, but also include some foods that are regarded as healthy. For instance, we advise for in the NNR increased consumption of whole grain products, like whole grain bread. 
and whole grain bread or bread is the main, based on energy and amount and weight, main ultra-processed food consumed in most Nordic and Baltic countries. So it's in conflict, in fact. So on the contrary, we have advised, we have developed 13 advices that are more specific on processed foods. That hits the target much better than the more unprecise definition or categorization of ultra-processed food that is practiced in today. For a dietary pattern, we have an advice, and also, but, and, but we did not have an advice for meal pattern, as we think the evidence is not strong enough for that. So this is the really take home message today, I think from the report. A plant-based diet, high in vegetables, fruits, berries, pulses, potatoes, and whole grains, ample intake of fish and nuts, limited intake of red meat and poultry, and moderate intake of low-fat dairy products, and finally, minimal intake of processed meat, alcohol, processed food, containing high amounts of fat, salt, and sugar. That is really the take-home message. Some of these are argued from environment, and some are supported from health, and we clearly state what is from health and what is from, from environment. And that will also be presented later today. Some are, in, are supported both from environment and, and, and health, and some are only supported by environment. You will learn much about this later today. So I hope you will like, you like the report. I hope you will read the report. I hope you will dig deep in the report. And uh, you will have a small teaser from, from the, some members of the committee during this webinar. So, have fun. <laughs> have fun. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, is it okay if I ask you a few yeah, questions, yeah, even though I did um, before? Now we're yeah. standing very far from each other, but uh, if you stand here, because I think the light is like reflecting you. So, um, thank you for the, for the presentation, of course. Like, what, what was the most challenging aspects of integrating sustainability? We have some questions from, from the viewers yeah. that have come in. Um, I, I think the most, um, most difficult issue was to, uh, to select science from uh, policy implementation. Uh, I think that was the most... Uh, I think we have done it quite well. I think we have been very uh, clear and open about our report, that it is a scientific report, and it is not influenced by politics. Of course, there has been a lot of special interest, a lot of lobbying, but I think we have managed to be uh, quite strict on, on... So this report is a scientific report. So, uh, as you say, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation 2023 is science advice mm. for, for the health authorities in the Nordic and the Baltic countries. Uh, what, which degrees can they be generalized like in other regions of, of the world? I think a lot. Um, the resources used to develop such a report is, is it's huge. And very few countries have the resources to do it. So I think it, will, it is a huge... Uh, the global harmonization that I'm talking about is really important to share resources and develop better and stronger, um, stronger methodology and stronger reports. I mean, the method we have, we have communi quite, communicated quite a lot with other authorities during this, uh, this work, and we have learned a lot from their experience. And we have had very good discussion on how to improve it and to, how to move it forward. And I think we have brought it, this uh, methodology even more in front than the previous editions and the previous editions in other countries. So I think this type of, of collaboration between the authorities is really important, and I think a lot of the work we have done here can easily be transferred to other regions. However, it should, when it comes to, to environment, of course, uh, you need to, to also take care of the local context. So it needs to be implemented into the local context of every single country. So we look forward to rolling it out in the world then. Yes. <laughs> we will hear more from you later on again. 
Thank you so much, Rune. Uh, now I will hand over to uh, some of the distinguished members of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation Committee for 2023. And first up is Jakob Buell Christensen, researcher from the University of Oslo in Norway. And you are here to speak about uh, the cutting edge mythology that was used actually for setting these recommendations. Are you ready? Yes. Perfect. Indeed. Take Thank it away. So I will stand over here. Okay, hello, good morning everyone. So my name is uh, Jacob and I'm a member of the uh, NNR 2023 committee and the aim of this section is to, to take you through some of the um, new and uh, updated methodology for setting the nutrient recommendations. So to update the dietary reference values or the DRVs as we call them, we use the harmonized cutting edge methodology. So we built on methods from the Nordic Nutrition uh, Recommendation, of course, and the Institute of Medicine and National Academies uh, of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the US, and the European Food Safety Authority in Europe. And by doing so, we further developed and uh, harmonized the cutting-edge methodology for nutrient recommendations. And the key here, as stated many times today already, is the potential for sharing of resources. We believe that this improves the quality of the final output. So let's now have a look at some of the main and major improvements in NNR 2023 from a methodological standpoint. A major improvement is that we documented the source publications and criteria for setting DRVs in a transparent way. Much more detail is provided in the report and appendix, uh, of course, and the nutrient-specific background papers. And here are just a few examples for some of the vitamins. For vitamin A, for example, we derived an average requirement and a recommended intake. Here is the source publication. And here's the criteria for setting the reference value, or the indicator, as we call it. For vitamin A, this was a factorial approach with a target liver concentration of 20 micrograms of retinol per gram liver. Here we see a few other uh, uh, examples of indicators. And I just want to emphasize also choline, because we'll come back to this in a while, uh, where we derived an adequate intake and a provisional uh, average requirement. Here's the source publica publication, and this was based on the observed intake in European countries, breast milk content, uh, and also the correction of deficiency symptoms. Another major improvement is that we documented the calculation of all updated DRVs in a transparent way. Again, much more details in the report appendix uh, and uh, associated background papers, but let's again have a quick look at uh, the examples of vitamin A and choline. So for vitamin A, the main DRV that we derived was the average requirement, and here are the values for adults. In the source publication, they assume a coefficient of variation of 15%, which then um, uh, leads to a multiplication factor of 1.3, uh, which then we can derive the recommended intake by calculating these values by 1.3 to derive the values given here. For choline, we start out with the adequate intake. Here are the values given for adults. Uh, we assume a coefficient of variation of 12.5%, which yields a multiplication factor of 0.8. We then calculate this to a provisional average requirement given here. So this is a very transparent way of documented, documenting where the values come from. Another major improvement is that we clearly show how we extrapolated from other life stage groups when there was insufficient data to set the DRV directly. And here we have an example for choline. Uh, what we do is we set an, um, um, uh, an AI for adults and for infants, here and here, and then we extrapolate to all other life stage groups. For example, for adults, the indicator was uh, correction of deficiency symptoms uh, by depletion-repletion studies, and here is the uh, adequate intake value. We then extrapolate this value down to younger age groups by allometric scaling, which means we take into account the assumed non-linear relationship between growth and the requirement. And we also take into account growth and accretion during this life stage, which then yields these values given here. For infants below up to six months uh, of age, uh, uh, the indicator was the observed in intake and the breast milk comp composition, uh, uh, which we then extrapolate up to infants the age uh, uh, 11 to, uh, 7 to 11 months um, by allometric scaling again. This should say 7 to 11 months. Uh, yeah. 
And then for pregnancy, we extrapolate from non-pregnant women by isometric scaling, which means we uh, assume a linear relationship between growth and the requirement. For lactation, we use the same value as non-lactating women, but we add an average amount uh, secreted into breast milk, here 120 milligrams, same as uh, for, for infants. And then we round all these values to the nearest uh, 10, and that's our AIs. And then we can derive the corresponding provisional average requirements. Um, and the same basic principle applies to all other nutrients. So the next major improvement is that we derived new reference weights for adults based on height and a healthy BMI of 23. We collected uh, updated reports and data um, uh, across all countries in the Nordics and Baltics, and then we averaged them um, and provide the height uh, values. And then we calculated the corresponding reference weights at a healthy BMI of 23, and these are the values we then provide in our tables. Similarly, we also derive new reference weights for children. Uh, we provide them here for ages uh, 0 up to 17 years. And again, we collected updated reports and data on growth, and we averaged them across all countries. For children up to 5 years, uh, we report the healthy weights and heights directly. Uh, but for children 6 to up to 17 years, we also collected healthy BMIs, um, uh, BMI values from WHO growth charts. And then we used the 50th percentile and the measured height to calculate the corresponding healthy uh, weights. Uh, and these uh, were all used in setting the DRVs, for example, when extrapolating from one life stage group to another. Another major improvement is that for harmonization purposes, we adopted a new set of life stage groups in NNR 2023. These new life stage groups are more in line with uh, Allen et al., a key paper in this work, and also EFSA's uh, life stage groups. For pregnancy and lactation, we still do not split into different age groups, but keep a single value per, uh, for pregnancy and for lactation. And there are also some other peculiarities here, such as the use of the median in an age span instead of the point age. We report the traditional DRVs known from NNR 2012, the AR, the RI, and the UL. I'll quickly go through them. The average requirement, given here, is the, um, uh, um, uh, the average requirement is the intake estimated to meet the requirements in half of the population. It's used to assess adequacy and plan diets for groups. The recommended intake, on the other hand, is the intake estimated to meet the requirement in almost everyone in the population. It's used to guide daily intake and to plan diets both for groups and for individuals. The upper level on the right is the highest intake, likely to pose no risk of adverse effects, toxicity, to almost everyone in the population. And intake, as intake increases above the UL, the potential risk of toxicity increases. Another major improvement is that we also now report three new DRVs in NR 2023. The AI, the provisional AR, and the CDRR. The adequate intake, the AI, given here, um, is the intake assumed to be adequate, often based on observed intake in the population. The AI likely exceeds the requirements for most individuals, and it's thus likely higher than the RI. An important point is, al is also that the AI has a larger uncertainty than the RI. The provisional average requirement is the equivalent of the AR. It's an approximation of the AR, but with much larger uncertainty than the AR. The chronic disease risk reduction is like an upper level, but for chronic diseases instead of classic uh, toxicity. And it is defined as the level above which intake reduction is expected to reduce chronic disease risk. Uh, we use the CDRR only for, for sodium, as we'll hear, hear more about later. Another major improvement is that we established a system of checks and balances to reduce the influence and impact of personal biases. An essential element uh, was that we created an organizational system or structure uh, with clear responsibilities. And some uh, specific features of this system were that uh, we split the project into discrete parts, uh, which were done by separate experts. We involved experts from several nutrition and non-nutrition sub-disciplines. Uh, the um, scientific advisory group, uh, the SUG, peer-reviewed and advised on principles and methodologies and also the final report. 
We had a thorough process of handling conflicts of interest. Background papers were authored and peer-reviewed uh, by independent scientists. We used a modified AMSTAR uh, to um, evaluate systematic reviews that would feed into the background papers. Uh, papers were developed based on workshops and consultation with reference groups. And we had an extensive public consultation of background papers and also the final report. And as has been mentioned, uh, the process for handling uh, comments from uh, public consultations were also quite extensive uh, with the report to be published. The final major improvement that I'll bring your attention to is that we defined a clear set of principles to, um, um, to set the DRVs. I've already touched on many of uh, these, but here I'll just uh, try to bring it all together. Uh, here I'll made an illustration of the principles depicted as a workflow. So first we do an extensive uh, literature review and identify the source documents. And then we define the criteria for any given nutrient. And then we define the criteria for setting the DRV or the indicator. And some key points is that we try to strive for harmonization with other organizations, uh, the use of most updated literature or sources, and the use of methods similar to what we described in some of our background papers. We then evaluate the totality and the strength of the evidence, uh, including whether or not there is a dose response available or if a factorial approach is more appropriate. Um, and then we ask the question, is there sufficient evidence to set an average requirement? If the answer is uh, yes, we set uh, the AR for a specific life stage group and then extrapolate to other life stage groups. And then we derive a best estimate of the coefficient of variation and try to calculate the recommended intake. If there is insufficient evidence to set an average requirement, we ask, is there sufficient evidence to set an adequate intake? If no, then no DRV is established for this nutrient. But if yes, we set an AI for this specific nutrient and life stage group, extrapolate, and then we calculate the recommended intake. So that's the basic uh, process. And then this is quite similar uh, for uh, setting upper level uh, intakes. And with that, I think I will hand it over to Rick Andersen or maybe do a few questions first. Yes, if that's OK. Thank you so much. You can maybe come over okay. here. Well, I'll give him, a, give him a round of applause, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, yeah. Uh, so we have some questions, actually, yeah. that come in as well from the audience here. Um, uh, what is the most important implication of the updated methodology? I think I will have to go back to what Rune said about sharing of uh, resources. I mean, this is a very thorough and comprehensive process and the ability to use uh, methods and methodologies developed by uh, IOM, NASM, EFSA, and also now NR for other organizations. I think that's the uh, most important application of the work. Hmm. Thank you. And also here, uh, what is needed to go beyond state of art when it comes to methodologies for setting nutrient recommendations? That's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> I think, I think uh, uh, we will have to keep working on finding data gaps and to try and uh, fill those data gaps with uh, um, new methodologies and new data. I think that's the, the next uh, uh, obvious step. Yeah. Next obvious steps. Well, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation, Jakob. Sure. Um, we will bring up the next speaker, and next to share her knowledge is Rikke Andersen, who is a senior researcher at Technical University of Denmark. And uh, you will explain a little bit more about the main scientific foundation behind the recommendation. Yes. Yeah? Uh, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Perfect. Take it away. So in this part of the presentation, we would like to introduce the Qualified Systematic Reviews, which is the main scientific foundation in the NNR 2023. Um, we have used qualified systematic uh, reviews to evaluate the causal effects of nutrients in all food groups on health outcomes. And when you compare qualified systematic reviews with other kind of reviews, uh, narrative reviews or scoping reviews, uh, qualified systematic reviews have the least bias and the best quality. And this is why NR 2023 have used the qualified systematic reviews as the main scientific foundation for, for evaluating causal effects of nutrients of food groups on health outcomes. And in NNR uh, 2023, we have def um, identified and included about 100 systematic reviews as qualified systematic reviews and produced nine uh, de novo or nine new qualified systematic reviews. And now we will have a closer look at that.
this is good. Okay. Um, so many systematic reviews uh, on the effect of nutrients of food groups on health outcome have been published already. And some of these systematic reviews are, of course, of very high quality, and we therefore have used them as part of the evidence base in NNR 2023. But in order to decide which systematic reviews should be included as qualified systematic reviews, we have used inclusion and inclu exclusion criteria uh, that are summarized here. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but you can read more about these inclusion and exclusion criteria in this paper from 2020 by Christensen, where you also can find more information about the principles and the methodologies used in NNR 2023. And this paper is the first in a three-part series describing how we plan to update the NNR. Yeah, and here you see a few uh, examples of the qualified systematic reviews that we have included. And the majority um, of the qualified systematic reviews we have included uh, were commissioned by the National Academics of Science, Engineering and Medicines in the US, the NASM, or the European, European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, and of course, of course also the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, the NNR, former versions of NNR. Uh, and in the second paper, yeah, in the second paper uh, from 2020 by Arneson, uh, the basic structure and the rationale of the qualified systematic reviews that we have included are described further, and I will not go into detail with that now. Um, and I would just also like to present the third paper in this series. Um, and uh, this is uh, called the Handbook for Qualified Systematic Reviews. And in this paper, uh, the methodology for developing new systematic, new qualified uh, systematic reviews are described, and we use this eight-step uh, process when new qualified systematic reviews were developed. And the eight steps are that first we define the research question, develop a protocol, make a, a literature search strategy and, and, and perform the literature search. We screen and select the, in, the studies to be included, extract data, uh, assess the risk of bias, uh, grade the total strength of evidence, and then, of course, uh, make some reporting um, afterwards. Uh, we prioritize the topics uh, to, uh, for the new, the, the, the novel systematic reviews through a six-step process in order to identify the most relevant topics. And the first step was uh, an open web-based uh, nomination process, where 45 nominations came. In the second step, uh, the NNR committee uh, made scoping reviews uh, of, um, and we made 51 scoping reviews, going through almost 15,000 uh, review uh, articles. And in the third step, uh, qualified systematic reviews were identified, as I mentioned before, in order to omit making um, systematic reviews that were already done, that were already published. In step four, the uh, potential uh, systematic review topics were shortlisted by formulations of peer cut statements. And in the fifth step, the systematic review topics were graded into uh, high, medium, low importance. And in uh, uh, step six, the topics with high importance were prioritized during uh, two rounds of a modified Delphi process. And then we ended up with nine a new uh, de novo uh, qualified systematic reviews. And the way we prioritized uh, this, this open, transparent six-step procedure to identify the topics are described in this paper uh, by Heuer, uh, published in 21. So the nine new systematic reviews are coming here. There's one on protein in children, um, legume consumption in adults, 
animal versus plant-based protein and the risk of cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes, quality of dietary fat, um, entry fatty acids, nuts and seed, dietary fiber, uh, B12, and white meat consumption. And the last two ones are, are still in press. So to sum up, um, this new strategy um, of codified systematic reviews as a major foundation in NNR 2023 uh, includes the novel inclusion of uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that was described in paper one. We had a clear structure and rationale of the qualified systematic reviews included in paper two, described in paper two a procedure for developing new qualified systematic reviews in paper three, and a procedure for prioritizing the topics of the new systematic reviews, and that was described in paper four. So we believe that qualified systematic reviews are the major tool for harmonization and sharing resources, and also for improving uh, the quality uh, among health authorities internationally. And we believe and hope that the principles and the methods that we have uh, developed can serve as state-of-the-art uh, basis for other national uh, food and health authorities that plan to develop dietary reference values and food-based dietary guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. You're welcome. Please come and join me. I have a question for you that's come in here. Uh, uh, do you not consider any systematic reviews conducted or funded by industry as relevant at all? Uh, well, in, the, in an R2023, we have considered all systematic reviews, but uh, to reduce the risk of uh, bias, uh, we did not consider um, systematic reviews commissioned or sponsored by the industry. No, we did not. Hmm. Okay. Well, you are going to be here as well. There, w there is some more questions as well, and we might bring them up a little bit later. But for now, in, because obviously this is, this is uh, quite a lot of information, so uh, we need to have a little bit of a stretch so that you also have some brain space to listen to the other interesting speakers. So we will have a short coffee breaks, both for the people here joining us uh, live in Reykjavik, but also for the people online. So do not forget to stand up and stretch and go uh, and get some water, maybe go to the toilet. We will start back here again very sharp at 10 past 10. So please join us then for the next part of the webinar. Thank you for now.
here, uh, the average requirement and the provisional average requirement covers the needs of half the population. And uh, you have seen this slide previously. Uh, Rune has uh, uh, showed it. And uh, in this NNR, we have reference values for 34 nutrients. And this time, all the DRV has been recalculated. And uh, this is a great achievement. And it's, uh, you can find all the values in the report. And the DRVs uh, are available for all the age groups groups, which is a very uh, good thing. And of course, these three calculations are based on the extensive systematic literature review that has been done in this project. And uh, as a result of these recalculations, seven nutrients has received DRVs for the first time in the NNR, and they are vitamin K, biotin, pantothenic acid, choline, manganese, molybdenum, and fluoride. And I will get, get back to these uh, later in my presentation. And uh, since we have recalculated all the DRVs, uh, there are changes to all the DRVs. And uh, most of them are very slight, uh, but for nine nutrients, th these changes uh, have been 20% or more. And uh, these were vitamin E, vitamin B6, folate, B12, vitamin C, calcium, thiamine, zinc, and selenium. Uh, I will start off uh, with uh, the recommended intake ranges of macronutrients. That is the ranges for the energy-giving nutrients. And uh, this time around, uh, we have applied no changes to the previous intake ranges. So we will all be familiar with these uh, intake ranges for fat, protein, and carbohydrates. All the reference values for energy has been recalculated. And uh, this is, of course, due uh, to the new age groups. Uh, all the 19 age groups in the present NNR that is harmonized with EFSA uh, and... Um, um, ooh. And then, of course, the weight curves uh, also has an impact on these uh, reference values. And um, uh, when scrutinizing these uh, values uh, on energy, uh, however, uh, the changes are not that great. Then uh, we come to the dietary reference values for the micronutrients, uh, which is... Uh, um, the average requirement, which is the value uh, based on the literature, which is used to derive the recommended intake. Um, the average requirement covers, as I said, 50% of the needs of the population, and the recommended intake covers uh, about 98% uh, of the population's need. Uh, when it's not possible to arrive and add average requirement, uh, we have derived an adequate intake. And uh, the adequate intake is a more uncertain value, and it's based on observed or experimentally derived approximation, or um, more commonly, uh, the average intake in a population. And the adequate intake is then uh, used to derive the provisional average requirement. And uh, all of these uh, reference values is available for all the age groups. Uh, for the first time in the NNR, we have derived a chronic disease reduction intake derived for sodium. And uh, this uh, CDRR is defined as the level above which intake reduction is expected to reduce chronic disease risk within a life stage in the general population. And once again, this is available for all the age group. And I wanted to point out that for all age groups above 15 years, the CDRR is 2.3 grams, which is equivalent to 5.75 grams of table salt. And as I pointed out, seven nutrients have received a DRV for the first time in this uh, NNR. And uh, they have uh, received an adequate intake and the provisional ARs. And for all uh, nutrients except fluoride, uh, the, um, the 
average intake in European populations have been uh, uh, how the AR has been arrived. For fluoride, uh, the intake uh, that prevents caries among children has been used uh, to uh, set the AI and extrapolated at other age groups. Also this time, uh, you will see that some uh, values that used to have an AR and an RI in the previous edition has received an adequate intake in a provisional AR this time around. And uh, this means that uh, these values are uh, less uncertain uh, than the other values. And uh, why have we done this time? Uh, we had an RI and an AI. Uh, uh, it's so difficult with all these values. Uh, an RI and an AR in the previous, but this time around we have actually uh, set the average intake for the first time. So I just wanted to go through a theoretical example of how these uh, DRVs are used when assessing diets of a population group. And you see here two distribution curves. Uh, one is pink and the other one is blue. And uh, the pink curve is the requirement of the population. And uh, ha at, at half uh, at the middle of the curve of the requirement is the average requirement. And uh, that uh, is covering the needs of 50% of the population. And then we have the blue line, which is the assessed intake in the population group. And then, when using the AR, in this case, we would look at the green strike proportion in this figure. And then we see that this proportion is pretty small. And we would conclude that um, the proportion of the population that has an intake below AR is pretty small. And on a population level, uh, the inadequacy of this nutrient is not that great. I also wanted to give you a real, a real example from a dietary survey conducted in the Nordic countries. And this is uh, from uh, the latest dietary survey in Iceland, and it's among the women. And uh, you see uh, in the table uh, the self-reported intake uh, of vitamin C. The average requirement in the NNR 2023 is 75 milligrams. And as you see, uh, when we compare the 50th percentile uh, with the AR, they are similar. So this means that 50% of uh, the population has an intake below AR, uh, while 50% of the population has an intake above uh, the AR. And how this is deemed or how, how you would deal with this, uh, I guess it's up to the uh, North to, to the, to, to the uh, Icelandic uh, people. But this is the way uh, we use uh, the AR. Um, and uh, we have uh, talked about this a lot. All the DREs have been recalculated uh, in, this in this round of the NNR. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the vitamin C uh, that I talked about. And uh, if you compare the values from 2012 with 2023, you see that actually these values have increased with 50%. And that is based on um, the cutoff level for uh, the indicator uh, that has been used to set this uh, value. And uh, more information uh, on the reference values uh, are available in the report. Um, no, this is not my picture, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> That's great. You got to, got to improvise there a little bit with some new, new pictures. I, I think it might have been <laughs> in the presentation previously. No problem. Um, so Eva, some questions for you here. Uh, what are the implications of these new and updated dietary reference values? I think that the, uh, in this time around, we have, I, I don't think, how, how many times have we said all the different age groups? And this is 
a great thing because we will be able to assess the diets in all population groups. Ah, that's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a second question for you here. Which nutrients seem to be lacking or at suboptimal intakes in the diets in the Nordics and the Baltics? Is it, is it, can you answer this? Uh, it's, it's a tricky question because I guess it will be uh, nutrients, different nutrients in all the countries. So I would say that this is, going, this is the great thing with the NNR reference values, that these will be used and we will have information about this uh, when they are being implemented. Well, thank you very, very much, Eva, for, for this uh, presentation. Did we actually give an, uh, an uh, applaud? I don't think we did. We did. Oh, well, then she gets a double. That's all good. Well done. Thank you so much. Good. Perfect. Um, so uh, the report is actually filled with recommendations and guidelines, guidelines how we should eat. And when we look at health, the report offers recommendation on improved health. And let me now invite up on stage here with me, please, Inga Thuisdotter, uh, who has actually been part of the committee four times. So that, that in itself is an achievement. You're a professor at the University of Iceland and Landspitali Iceland to tell us a little bit more about the improved health. Please Thank enter you. the stage. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you, those I see. <laughs> I know about the others. Um, I will uh, talk to you about the food recommendations, and now I have to... Where is the changer here? Like that. Yes. Uh, to develop food-based dietary guidelines, we evaluated health effects uh, and... Um, uh, nutrients, health challenges, and environmental impact in a four-step procedure. And first, the health effects of food groups were considered. Uh, the background papers of respective food groups were uh, the main basis, and quality systematic review basis for evidence on association with chronic disease outcomes. Second, we considered whether the food group contributes significant amounts of essential nutrients to the general population in Nordic and Baltic countries. Third, we considered public health challenges related to health effects of food groups and health effects related to prevalent chronic diseases were given priority. Fourth, we considered the environmental impact of consumption of the food groups. We assessed, oops, we assessed health effects of 15 food groups and meal and dietary patterns for the first time in the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations. As health effects of food groups are the primary focus of setting food-based dietary guidelines, extensive uh, assessment were included. Quantitative uh, food-based dietary guidelines are given and suggested to author authorities if there is a strong overall evidence of an association and a dose-response curve has been developed in a qualified uh, meta-analysis. And also when food group is considered essential for nutritional adequacy. Examples of guidelines giving range from low to maximal intakes are, as Rune mentioned here uh, in the first talk today, fish, nuts, milk and dairy, vegetable fruits and berries. An example of guideline using an upper level in case of adverse effect of high intakes and no relevant lower level is red meat. An example of a lower level in the case of no relevant upper level is whole grain. Qualitative food-based dietary guidelines without amounts are defined and suggested to authorities if there is sufficient evidence for causality, but the representative dose-response curve cannot be established. Development of background papers on health effects of foods, here as a schematic figure, 
on the process started with an unpublished scoping review, as you heard uh, before today, and giving instructions to authors. And as you see, the quality systematic reviews, both the international and those made especially for the Nordic recommendations, were used here. Uh, you also see the manuscripts went through peer reviews as well as public consultations before ending with a final version. The evaluation of strength of evidence for a course between uh, the food group and health was based on quality uh, systematic reviews, as you have so well heard already. Uh, and uh, there were several or many uh, uh, quality systematic reviews behind its food group. And uh, here you see uh, a list of those, and you see a list here of the uh, reviews. It is to speak if you look at table two in the report. It's impossible to see here, actually. So, so you will see there that there are several uh, systematic reviews behind. And uh, here we see the list of background papers for the health assessment of foods, or table four in the report. Most of these resulted in food-based dietary guidelines, but as before, uh, Rune has already mentioned those not in, in uh, specific guidelines, as, for example, the ultra-processed food. Um, we also uh, could use these four background papers, made especially for the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation, First, a unique paper uh, published in 2022, or 2022, as some of us say, uh, on food consumption and nutrient intake in the adult population by Eva Varenshjel Lemming, who just gave you a talk, and Tagli Pizzi. Second paper, also published last year, about um, about the human body weight by uh, Yelmeseth and Schieberg. And in press are two papers, Burden of Diseases in the Nordic and Baltic countries by Klaassen and colleagues, and Physical Activity by Borodulin and Andersen. And all these interesting papers are focusing on the Nordic and Baltic countries. I want to say a few words about our collaboration with the Global Burden of Disease experts. And this general background paper came to interesting results. There is a substantial disease burden attributed to dietary risk factors in the region, particularly from ischemic heart disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, and colon and rectal cancers. Diet low in whole grains was the highest ranked dietary risk factor in all Nordic and Baltic countries. Uh, and diet high in processed meat was the second highest contributor to disease burden five of eight countries. And among the top four risk factors in all the countries. Diet low in fruit was the third highest dietary related contributor to disease burden. And a diet high in red meat was the fourth highest dietary uh, risk factor for uh, disability-adjusted life years in the Nordic and Baltic countries. Uh, building uh, science advice for a healthy and environment-friendly diet in Nordic and Baltic countries, we describe for each food group and for dietary pattern, as you see here in the second column, the health effects of foods on chronic diseases not attributed to specific nutrients. And then in the third column, the health effects of, uh, based on nutritional adequacy and the effects of specific nutrients. Here you see uh, two examples. First one is for pulses, that's bean, lentils, and peas. 
Intake of these foods may protect against cancer and premature mortality, uh, but we have not sufficient evidence to set a quantitative guideline. Pulses also contribute with protein, fiber, and many, many essential nutrients, such as folate, uh, potassium, magnesium, iron, zinc, and thiamine, uh, as well as uh, bioactive compounds. Second example uh, is dietary pattern. Uh, healthy dietary patterns are associated with beneficial health outcomes, such as reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cancer, declined bone health, and premature death. And healthy dietary patterns are micronutrient dense, including high intake of unsaturated, uh, uh, including uh, high intake of unsaturated fats and fiber, and low intake of saturated fat, added and free sugars and sodium. The building of science advice uh, for a healthy and environment environment-friendly diet is continued, of course, with the environmental impact we will hear about in just a few minutes uh, from my colleague, and finalized with advice to authorities. Uh, context of the individual country is relevant when formulating national food-based dietary guidelines. Oh, now I did something with the microphone, sorry. Um, yesterday, actually, we heard on the news about faster increase in temperature in Europe than ever before. It was a very strong <laughs> uh, reading of the, of the news yesterday. Uh, and this is reported by the World Meteorological Organization. And so reactions are necessary. And the uh, Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023 science advice can be used to meet this and be at the same time based on the health effects of foods, public health challenges and burden of diseases. Thank you. Now this applaud I heard. <laughs> Good, well done. Uh, Question from, from the online viewer, and I also think this question is interesting. Um, so, how should the food-based dietary guidelines be like translated, if you say, for children? Yes. Uh, they have a lower energy yes. requirement. So, what, 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 would, what would you mm. say about this? Yes, this is a very wise question, because we have uh, uh, dietary reference values, like uh, average requirement, recommend intake, etc. we have for different age groups. We have not developed it actually for food-based guidelines, even though we have this extensive assessment and came to these conclusions about adults. Uh, but I see, and we have started to calculate it in, in, um, at my workplace, and I know in workplaces all over the Nordic countries, how to translate it in amounts. And the easy way is to just look at the energy need of children, and then you can uh, use that to translate over to amounts of food. That's the easiest and most uh, obvious way forward. So if you calculate, for example, you, you will come a little lower for the children, of course. Uh, uh, so they are like in, in the fruit, vegetables, and, 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 and they are like in 300 to five, 600 grams. You know, it depends on their age, of course. So we will have to calculate from the age, four to seven, and in the intervals actually we give. So we can use the energy uh, recommendations to calculate over to children. So that's maybe something we'll do together. That is, <laughs> that is definitely maybe something that we can do useful. together. Hopefully the viewers that, that, uh, that asked the question also can benefit from that yeah, answer. Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Thank you very much, Thank Inga, you. for this. I definitely know now how to improve at least my, my diet towards more healthy alternatives. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more speaker. Please come up before Rune joins us again to sum up. And... Uh, you want to stand there, yeah? Uh, so, as I mentioned initially, the recommendations also integrates now the environmental aspects, and it's for the first time. And here, 
to share our knowledge about this is Maria Lisa Ercola, who is professor from the University of Helsinki, Finland. And please, please take the floor to share your insights on the topic. Thank you. Good morning. NNR 2023 marks a notable milestone in integrating environmental aspects of food-based dietary guidelines for the first time. I would like to remind you that these environmental aspects were discussed in the previous edition, but what we did this time, we integrated them, so that's the difference. The most recent IPCC report from, uh, concludes with very high confidence that climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health, and there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. It also concludes uh, with a high confidence that uh, a diet featuring plant-based foods, such as one based on whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and animal-sourced food produced in resilient, sustainable and low greenhouse gas emission systems, present major opportunities for adaptation and mitigation while generating significant co-benefits in terms of human, human health might sound familiar, the list of the foods here. Here we present some of the most important documents we used in our work. Uh, in NNR 2023, integrating environmental sustainability was actually requested, as it has been mentioned already, by the Nordic Council of Ministers. The governing documents here they include the action plan and four declarations that are all built on the UN Agenda 2030 and the uh, pa Paris Agreement. In addition, the evidence for environmentally sustainable food consumption was based on the IPCC report and the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services here. And finally, on our NNR, five NNR background papers on sustainability, including a summary of this SAPIA report. To integrate the environmental sustainability, we followed the FAO WHO guiding principles. The health aspect was our primary focus, as was introduced in the previous presentation by Inga. The environmental impacts, they cover a wide range of different domains, greenhouse gas emission, uh, water use, land use, nitrogen and phosphorus use, chemical pollution and biodiversity impact. However, the uh, socio-cultural and socio-economic aspects, we consider them as country-specific issues. They depend on national policies and need to be considered on the national, by on, on our national authorities. However, we have discussed these issues in our background papers at the background for the national authorities when they start developing their national guidelines. As mentioned already, we built a foundation for integrating the sustainability issues on these uh, by these five background papers. Uh, first two papers, these have been developed as a collaboration between our NNR project, Chapman House and Nurik and Baltic experts. The first one by Benton, uh, it provides a global overview and five key considerations on the issue. The second one by Harvard, it, it actually narrows the scope down to the Nurics and it uh, suggests overall and food, food group specific changes in consumption and also discusses uh, opportunities for production in Nordic and Baltic countries. Then these two other papers, they have been in a very central in our process. The third one by Trolle, it actually compiles all the recent studies 
on the sustainability, environmental sustainability of the Nordic diets at the present. It also introduces different approaches for developing national sustainable food-based dietary guidelines. So I consider this paper very useful for the national authorities when they start their work. And the fourth paper by Meltzer, it actually goes beyond the diet and it has the food system approach and a specific focus on food production. And then the fifth paper, which I have already mentioned, it's a summary of the Sapia report with Nordic and Baltic examples included. Uh, we have described the role of health and environment a very clear and transparent way and here I use cereals as an example. First, we considered health effects of food groups not attributed to specific nutrients. For cereals, it was based on seven qualified systematic reviews and in addition, as we heard from Inga, the whole grains was the highest ranked dietary risk factor in the global burden of disease assessment in the Nordic and Baltic countries. Then, secondly, we present the health effects of foods based on nutritional adequacy and effects of specific nutrients. And for cereals, these relate to the high wiper content and also the content of many essential nutrients. Finally, here are the environmental impacts. And we uh, considered environmental impacts for cereals uh, rather low. Grain-based foods, they can be produced with relatively modest environmental impacts, except for rice. Actually, we consider cereals as the key foods when we transit towards the more environmental friendly diet. So the final recommendation is shown here. It's to have an intake of at least 90 grams a day, including whole grains in products. But this is the amount is for whole grains. And uh, we believe that there are likely further benefits of higher intake. And whole grain cereals other than uh, rice should be preferred. Then quickly about the other food groups. Based on health outcomes, it is recommended to consume from 5 to 800 grams per day or more vegetables, fruits and berries. And this is actually supported by the environmental, uh, the low environmental footprint of these groups. The variety of vegetables and fruits should be consumed and with a special emphasis on fiber-rich products. Uh, legumes and potatoes, for both of them, we advise increased consumption, which is supported for environmental reasons, but also for their nutrient content and for legumes, the health outcomes, as was introduced by Inga. Uh, from 20 to 30 grams of, of nuts per day is advised to be consumed for all nutrients, health and environmental reasons. We also advise to increase the consumption of seeds for nutrient content. And finally here, fats and oils. Uh, fats and oils, the minimum amount of 25 grams per day is recommended and this is uh, for the sufficient intake of essential fatty acids, namely uh, alpha-linolenic acid. And this is for adults uh, and for per 10 megajoules of energy. It's also advised to limit the consumption of butter and tropical oils for both nutrient and environmental reasons. And then about animal sourced foods for fish, the health-based advice is to consume from 3 to 450 grams per week and of, of that amount at least 200 grams per week should be fatty fish. And this advice is based on the content of the entry fatty acids to ensure the sufficient intake of them. Um, and then what is very important for the fish groups that all the fish consumes, consumed should pre preferably come from sustainably managed stocks. And very much discussed red meat. The 
the all, all available evidence for red meat when we consider both beneficial effects of nutrients and adverse effects uh, for several chronic diseases, namely cancer, the intake should be maximum of 350 grams per week, and the intake of processed red meat should be as little as possible. However, for environmental reasons, the consumption should be considerably lower. As we know, the high consumption of red meat is the most important contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions of the, of, from the diet in Nordic and Baltic countries. For dairy, the daily intake uh, between 350 to 500 milliliters uh, will ensure that uh, that our diet meets the dietary requirements for calcium, iodine, and vitamin B12. The science advice is based on uh, nutritional adequacy, and it may be in conflict, conflict with the environmental impacts. As we know, in general, very high consumption of dairy, and especially the concentrated products as hard cheese, uh, contributes highly to the greenhouse gas emissions. And we already talked about cereals, so about eggs. Low intake may be included in the diet for nutrient adequacy. However, high intakes are not compatible with beneficial health and environmental impacts. And for both sweets and alcohol, no or limited intake is suggested for both health and environmental reasons. And this also applies to sugar sweetened beverages. So, we would like to, in the end, remind you that the diet is a complex system of interacting components that cumulatively affect both health and the environment. So therefore, there is a strong interconnectivity between the science advices of different food groups as well. So food group specific advice should always be interpreted in relation to the whole diet, as it's mentioned here. So this is our science advice and a framework for the national authorities, them to follow when they start developing their national sustainable food-based dietary guidelines. Thank you. Thank you so much for the present. Now I'm speaking in this yep. as well. <laughs> Double microphones. That is a bit silly. I don't need that. Thank you so much for Thank the presentation. Um, so I have a question for you here when it comes to the data. Um, so what are the main data gaps regarding the environmental impacts of food consumption, would you say, like in the Nordic and the Baltic countries? Very good question. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we have used the best available data when we have de developed the dietary guidelines, but we are also quite clearly pointing out the main data gaps for each of the food group. If I would need to bring up something, I would say that we need more country-specific data, especially for Baltic countries, and also we need more info on the environmental impacts of imported products. I would bring up those two, but we have many other well, needs for data. And wh why would you, why would you maybe bring up those two, like specifically? Would okay. you say? Yeah, because we were struggling with those. Especially, we didn't have data from Baltic countries when we were compiling all the data on the recent sustainability impact of the recent diet. So we really, I'm trying to challenge all this, that uh, scientists in Baltic countries to develop that type of data. So we're sending that out, <laughs> yeah, out to yeah. the viewers. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very yeah. much for a very interesting presentation thank as you. well. Thank you. Uh, so we are very much close. Yes. And that's it. Perfect. We're getting some energy into the room here as well. I hope you can feel it all across the globe as well. So we're coming to uh, a close of this very insightful webinar. Uh, Rune, I'm going to invite you back up here again for some final comments and maybe also some questions because I have a couple of more. Would you like me to ask you the questions before or would you like to f have your final comments before? Oh, please shoot. 
Shoot! Yeah. All right, I'm going to get you to stand here because the light catches your, your uh, head, head there. So uh, here is one of the questions that's come in. Um, uh, what method did you use to reach consensus for the food-based dietary guidelines? The report states that quality qualitative advice for food-based dietary guidelines are decided on consensus in a group of experts. Will the methodology and steps to reach the consensus be published? Yes, of course. The methodology to, um, to reach consensus on food-based dietary guidelines is first we consider are there any qualified systematic reviews that describe the causality be between exposure a diet and a health outcome. And then we consider whether there are any, and then it, during, uh, to, during have that consensus, we um, consider epidemiological studies, clinical studies, and mechanistic. So we have a, we, we have an inclusive approach when, when assessing causality. That's clearly described in our methodology papers. Then, if there is a causal, causal relationship, then we consider whether there is a dose-response curve available. If there is a dose-response curve available, we look at the dose, a meta-analysis, um, and then we, we try to see whether that can inform a quantitative food-based dietary guideline. An example of that is the whole grains or the meat. For whole grains, there is a clear um, um, reduced risk of, uh, of disease with increasing amount of intake. It levels off around 90 grams per day. And then it increased a little bit further. So that is why we say inc 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 include at least 90 grams per day of whole grains, but there are probably beneficial effects of, other, of also further intakes, higher intakes. Alternatively, um, we also we assess nutrients. If the food group is an essential, is, an, is, a, is a dominant source of specific fo essential foods, that can also be a cause, a reason for, for developing a quantitative food-based dietary guideline. And one example of that is milk. Uh, milk is an important source of iodine and calcium. And then we calculate how much iodine and calcium you need to have sufficient amount in the typical regular diet. Uh, and, then, and based on this, we give advice on intake of, of, um, of, uh, of, of, diet, of the milk and dairy. So that is the type of, of methodology we use. And uh, this is clearly described in the, in the summary report. And also you could dig much deeper in, in each of the of the background papers. Which we will do, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, I have another one here. If the provisional uh, AR, like average requirements, is derived as two SDs below the AI, despite being more useful than the AI, nevertheless, are they any less uncertain than the AI? <laughs> That's a very specific question. Yeah, I can try to explain. Um, when, as Jakob uh, explained to you, when we have relatively high certainty, then, then we define the, the classical DRVs. Average requirement first, and then based on average requirement, we calculate the recommended intake. <coughs> so the data trust on average requirement in each uh, life stage group. Then there are many instances where, where we cannot really derive a proper average requirement. And in US and EFSA, they have for some years used um, uh, um, dietary reference values called adequate intake. This is, most mo this is more uncertain and represent uh, the mean intake in a, in a, a healthy population. And that has been used, and, but it has also been misused in literature. Uh, and that is why we, we thought it would be nice to, uh, to, to, to include an AI in our recommendations. But then we went back, and, and instead of an RI, 
you are probably lost by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to follow. <laughs> yeah, but just two more sentences. <laughs> and then we, we went back and, and calculated and provisional AR from the, from the AI. Uh, you are probably lost, but please go into the report and there we are trying to explain this the best we can. So we think this for the, for the, for the specialist, I think this is a very useful tool. Uh, but for average people, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great <laughs> summary. <laughs> um, you know, based on what you've heard and obviously like the journey with, with uh, the recommendations, what is your final comments? Um, my final comment, I, first of all, I think I would like to uh, just... Um, I w we, did, we, we, we considered carefully what should we do with this webinar. We would like to present the report. One idea would be to go through all the results, but that would be so huge. There are so many new results in the, in the NLR 2023, so that would be boring. So what we are trying to do is to give you some tools, how, how we have worked with the methodology, the principles, how we have worked to develop the new DRVs and the new food-based dietary guidelines, so that you can have some insight into this. We are trying to explain some, uh, give you examples of the cutting edge methodology, I think really is important for the, for the new values and the guidelines. Um, the qualified systematic reviews, give an idea what that is. That's a crucial step. I think that is really a crucial step that no, no other authorities picks up on and use that kind of definition. So that's, that is important. Then we have given you some examples of the DRVs, there are many out there, but just an idea how, the, the, how they look like, and that there are many changes, how you should interpret the changes. The idea how we develop food-based dietary guidelines, and also how we integrate the framework. So, so I would like to end then by, by saying that I think the Nordic Council of Ministers, they was extre extremely brave some years ago when they decided to update the NNR, not only by including uh, updated uh, ref di nutrient reference values, nutrient values, but also to ask us to uh, develop a framework for developing food-based dietary guidelines, but most importantly, to, to integrate environment. That was brave. So now we have done the work, we have delivered the, the, the report, and now it is up to the authorities in each country to implement this. We expect the, the countries to implement the dietary reference values, and then to consider whether there is a need for any policies. We expect the governments and the, the authorities to implement the framework for developing food-based dietary guidelines. To set and as you the framework is developed so, so that we have not set the target for the environment impl implementation of environment. That is up to the national uh, uh, authorities to do. So we expect them to set ambitious targets for for the environmental effects, and then to develop policy to meet the targets within a few years. Thank you. Thank you for those closing words, and I think it's very clear to to uh, see what you actually expect from the from the governments and the countries out there. And as you mentioned, not just the Nordic councils or ministers that was brave. We need to be brave in order to speed up speed up the work. So, and I think this webinar was everything but boring. I think you did a great job, all of you. So thank you very much, of course, to Rune and all of the members that have been up here on stage here from, from the committee and for all of the work that you have put in to, to launch the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation 2023. We will now close this webinar and there will uh, be uh, there will be the next event will be the launch event, which will take place here at two, uh, two o'clock Icelandic time. So until then, uh, 
I, on behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers, say thank you and thank you to everyone that have participated and of course that have been watching online. Thank you.